Well, I've been to some unusual locations in my time, but never to a museum associated with the jail. We're in Derby, and this is indeed the old Derby jail. Way back in the 1700s, of course, to come for that door there, into the cells, the very, very likely the next time we left here would be actually to your execution. It is indeed a working museum, absolutely full of stories. And tonight we're going to meet a gentleman that knows more ghost stories that you and I can shake a stick at. A gentleman known simply as Mr Richard Felix. Please follow me and we'll have a good chat to him. Well, I'd like to warmly welcome you to Derby Jail here in the fantastic city of Derby. I'm joined by one of the most familiar faces within the world of ghost walking and ghost tours, the fantastic Richard Felix. Oh, me, sorry. <laughs> nice to see you, Richard. <laughs> and you, sir, nice to see you. Welcome to Derby Jail. Fantastic to be here, Richard. I know there's many, many people listening and indeed watching mm. who'll be fascinated to know why you started the ghost walks here in Derby and what is your fascination with the spirit world? Well, I'm frightened of ghosts. Right. I've been frightened of ghosts since I was four, uh, and I'm still frightened of ghosts. That's why probably some people have noticed that on certain TV programmes, I was always the one that never volunteered to go off on a lone vigil. Right. Because I'm genuinely still frightened of ghosts, even though I preach to everybody that they're not there to get you, because they're not. Right. Uh, but I have this fear of them. Um, but that's not the real. That's not the reason I got into the ghost business. I mean, I was chairman of Derby Tourism, <laughs> and people laughed. They still laugh. Tourism, Derby. You must be mad. Uh, but um, so I became chairman, and I was looking for something, hmm. something to attract people to the city of Derby. Yeah, because yeah. um, we've knocked most of it down. That's the problem, you see. Right. Um, and I opened a heritage centre, which was an old grammar school from the 1500s, and it got a ghost in it. Ghost of a little boy um, in the dormitories upstairs, hmm. and um, it just made me think. Ghosts. Well, York do ghost walks, and an awful lot of people go to York. To go on the ghost walk. Yes. I mean, there's yeah. nine, I think, at yes. least, yeah. per yeah. night. Yeah. So I thought, why don't we try it? So I started a ghost walk um, it, 25 years ago, this coming January. Gosh. Yeah. Um, and since then, we've taken a million and a half people on a ghost walk around the city. Of you know, Richard, you've hit it on the nail. Tourism. Yeah. Uh, ghost tourism plays a huge, huge industry here in England, isn't it? It is. Oh, absolutely. A huge industry. Yeah. And, and even more since since programmes like Most Haunted have yes. been on the scene. Yeah. Because um, now people visit the sites. Um, and as you say, ghost tourism is huge. Huge. And people visit this site and then they go, they, they holiday. They'll say, what are we doing the East Midlands? And we're going to do Nottingham, we're going to do Derby, we're mm. going to do Leicester, we're going to do all the places that they've seen on Most Haunted. It, you know, television has a... A lot to answer for. Yes. <laughs> it really does, but it it's, it's works well. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. certainly mm, ghost tourism for Derby. Yeah. Um, I've declared Derby the, the most haunted city in Great Britain. Right, right. And that's in print, so it must be true. It's yeah. in, it was in the Sun newspaper, right. so it's got to be true, right. it? must it? be. And uh, Richard, you're very much a Derby lad, aren't oh, you? Oh, very. This, oh, yeah. this is your yeah. city, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, oh yeah, Derby born and bred, yeah. which is also unusual, because you see... I, I always say that, I, I call it the seaside syndrome. People that live at the seaside don't go on the beach. Right. They go to Derbyshire for the beach. Right. So in other words, yeah. I, I'm unusual from being from Derby and having a passion for Derby. Mm. It's normally visitors. Someone that comes in and, and sees the potential from another town or city that actually starts something going as regards promoting the city. But to be actually a Derby lad that, that's trying to promote Derby is unusual. Um, and that's why people it's say It's something you're very proud of though, isn't it? Oh, I am. Very, I'm, very, very proud of it. I'm very, yeah. very... I am proud of the city. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm self-styled Mr. Derby. Yes, I, I, uh, I can believe that. Even down to the fact that I'm, <laughs> I've, even, I've even got a suit made out of Derby tweed, um, a Derby umbrella, a, a Derby... a brown Derby hat, a pair of Derby shoes. Um, the only thing I haven't got is a pair of Derby underpants, I'm afraid. Right, uh, right. No such sort of thing for us there. What a great place to start a ghost walk from, the, the Derby Jail. Oh, it is. And, and this is the original Derby this Jail. This Derby isn't Jail, it? it goes back to 1750. No, well, when you say original, no, there was, a, there was one before. Right. There was one from 1580 um, on the corner of the Corn Market uh, and St Peter Street in Derby. Um, and that was a foul, stinking place. Um, very famous, had some amazing, mm. uh, famous people there. Three witches uh, in prison there. 
Um, one died of jail fever before her execution. Two were hanged. Um, three Catholic priests imprisoned in there and taken out and hanged, drawn and quartered. Right. 37 recusants, Catholics imprisoned in the jail. Mm. 12 died of jail fever in the first week of imprisonment. Um, a visiting priest um, that was actually in disguise came to read them the, the last rites, yeah. was recognised and put on trial and also sentenced to be hanged, drawn and quartered, but died of the stench in Derby Jail before his execution. Um, so it was a famous place mm. from, from that yeah. point of view. Um, in fact, not only that, but the, the Quaker movement actually right. started in the original Derby Jail. Right. With George Fox. Gosh, George Fox was here. Oh, he was here in Derby. Amazing. Um, yeah. Arrested for blaspheming in, yes. the, in the great church of Derby. Oh, yes. Thrown yeah. into what he referred to as that foul, stinking dungeon, yes. Derby Jail. Yeah. And brought before the magistrate, um, who was the mayor of Derby, a guy called Gervais Bennett, and the magistrate said to him, uh, Mr. Fox, you, sir, it was the time of Cromwell, mm. and, and he yeah. said, you, sir, should respect the word of Parliament and the Commonwealth. And Fox leapt to his feet and said, and you, sir, should quake at the word of the Lord. And they locked him back in Derby jail, and he wrote in his journal, mm. they called us Quakers at Derby. Yeah, he must have been a very, very brave man. Oh God, yeah. George Fox has been a very brave man. Yeah. And, uh, where I come from, of course, up in Lancashire, I know. We've, got, we've got the hill, Pendle Hill. Yeah, of course. And it's said that George Fox walked on top of Pendle Hill and had a vision of a brand new religion. He saw areas that the good Lord showed him. But so, I didn't know that. But, but wow. what, a, what, a, what a brave guy. I mean, I, oh, yeah. I, 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 so we I, share him. Yes, yeah, yeah very much so, Richard. Yeah, no, yeah. I think he should have been, become a great English martyr, don't well, you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But yeah. you see, we haven't even got a plaque on the site of right, that jail right, to right. say that the Quaker movement started, or the name excellent, anyway, absolutely uh, started excellent, Richard, here. Excellent, yeah. But th then this came along, mm. uh, 1756, Right. Um, um, again, was the county jail. Any crime committed in Derbyshire, if you were caught, you ended up here. Um, but when it opened, it was, well, you'd be murdered for the coat off your back. It was a dreadful place. And, and there was no segregation. Young and old, male and female, tried or untried, Sane or insane, mm. we're all lumped together right, in the right. cells. So yeah. if you can imagine, well, rather not, yeah. what actually went on yeah. in here. Yeah. Awful. Yeah, amazing. So Richard, when you start the tours, do you start from the jail itself? Oh yeah, well I, yeah. Do, I do two. Right. I do a city centre, right. walk, which has yeah. nothing to do with here at all. Yeah. And then the Derby Jail Ghost Walk, or the Friar Gate Ghost Walk, right. call it, starts and finishes here. Yeah. Um, three hours, a couple of haunted pubs on the way around, right. candlelit supper, back in here. With a blazing yeah. fire and candle it again. I was amazed at how gorgeous the buildings are in Friargate. It's oh, like it's walking awesome. to a film set, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's, it's Derby's Georgian Quarter. Beautiful, um, beautiful. And, yeah. it, and the thing is that all those buildings that you see out there were here when the executions were taking place. Right, right. Because uh, from 1812, they established what's called the New Drop, mm. which is the trapdoor oh, and the right. lever. Right. Um, and that was in, in front of this building. Mm. Um, and so all the, and the houses that are here, still there, still here now, were there then and bear witness yeah. to the to the amount of execution. It's, it's almost like a time warp, isn't it? Really? Very much so. But yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Richard, the cells here—they're yeah. they're all different, of course. Oh yeah. yeah. But yeah. What, who was the most famous man that was ever kept here? Oh, Jeremiah Brandreth. Jeremiah Brandreth. Jeremiah Brandreth, the oh, ringleader. What's his story then? Well, he was the ringleader of England's last armed revolution. Right. The Nottingham captain, um, and he was a soldier in the Peninsular War, mm -hmm. um, and an out-of-work framework knitter. Because everyone had been thrown out. Well, not, had, there were thousands of soldiers um, and sailors roaming the streets after the Napoleonic Wars finished in 1815. Right. Um, and people were starving to death. The unemployment was was huge. Um, and in 1815, Mount Tambora erupted, and it was the biggest eruption in the world for 5,000 years. Right. And it caused winter in the summer of 1816, hmm. in the whole of Europe, and it snowed in England in, in June, My 1816, goodness. and yeah. the crops failed. Right. And the staple diet, of course, of the working man was, was bread. Mm. And, and they were starving. Mm. So all of the, the groups up and down the country, the workers, formed what were called Hamden Clubs. And, and they, were, they were socialists, they were not communists, but certainly so. Mm. And they wanted, all they wanted was bread for all. Right. A living wage yes. and, and food. Yeah. Um, and of course it was all to do with the Luddites as well and the, the machine breaking and the mm. fact that machines were taking over from man and all that sort of stuff. Um, but the government knew all about it. And these groups were had formed and they were going to overthrow Lord Liverpool's government, which was terribly unpopular, abolish the monarchy, establish an American-style presidency, 
with Sir Francis Burdett, who was a Derbyshire guy from Four Mark Hall in Derbyshire, as the first President of the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. That's how far this right. writing had got. Gosh, yes. uh, they've got their own battle flag, uh, a red, white and green tricolour, mm -hmm. their own battle song, weapons that are be being made and, and pikes and, and... But the government knew all about it. And all of the groups up and down the country from Manchester and Stockport and, and, and Nottingham and mm. Sheffield, they all stood down. But the Derbyshire men had been encouraged by an agent provocateur called Oliver to go on lads, you need to do this. There, everyone will come out and help you. The soldiers are waiting in London. They're all going to mm. come out and rise with you. Yeah. There'll be money and bread for all and beer when you get there. And these silly Derbyshire men believed it. And 250 of them marched on uh, June the 8th, 18. 17 towards Nottingham mm. um, and they got to the road um, leading to Nottingham a place called Giltbrook uh, there's an Ikea factory literally on the site right. now yeah. um, and lining the road were 18 mounted soldiers of the 15th Light Dragoons and someone shouted soldiers boys mm. and they just ran and fled yeah and rounded them up and brought them here Ringley just brought here mm. yeah yeah and, and they must have uh, been in a terrible state of health as well I should imagine oh, Christ, yeah. yeah 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 and the they were, they were big trials, a show trial of high treason was put on mm. to make an example of them, and the three ringleaders were sentenced to be hanged, drawn and quartered. Gosh, yes. Which in 1817 um, was late. Yes, yes, yeah. And that, that took place actually here, Richard. Oh, yeah. Actually In front here. of this building. In front of this very building. Oh, yeah, yeah. The okay. three men um, walked out of the corridor up there onto the, onto the uh, front of the building, mm. uh, and there was a ten-foot gallows, um, a drawing, quartering and beheading block, which is basically like a, a, a bed with a groove with a thing on the end for the neck to go on. Right. A butcher's block for human right. beings. Butcher's block. Uh, two yeah. black-handled knives, two mm. black-handled axes, mm. uh, and a bucket full of sawdust to be strewn over the, the gallows. Right. But the Prince Regent had, had signed the death warrant and commuted the drawing and quartering. Mm. So they hanged them for half an hour and beheaded them. Gosh. Yeah. It's the last sentence of hanging, drawing and quartering in provincial England. England's last armed revolution, mm. and whichever one of the three was the last one to be beheaded, right. is the last person in Great Britain to be beheaded with an axe, even though the they very, were very dead. last one. Yeah, yeah. Amazing wow. story. Richard. Oh, just a bit. That, 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 that's quite awesome. It's like you say, um, uh, with the building still surviving for that period. Oh no, yeah, it's, it's, it's almost it's still, it's still here, isn't it? Oh gosh, yeah. those buildings are more or less tortured. Yeah. Really, the yeah. block's still available. In, in available. The block's it's still, still in yeah. existence. Yes, and it's yeah. supposed to be haunted. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. They say when anyone that touches it, it hangs forever damp. Yeah. The blood of those three men never dries on it, Eric. Gosh, gosh, gosh. So it's got a hell of a story to yeah. it as well. Yeah, so Richard, as well as the ghost walks, I know you mm. take a very, very keen interest in British military, don't you? Oh, Joe, oh, yeah, that's my passion in and, life. And I do believe that you were, were you a member of the Royal Green Jackets? At no, no, I was a Worcestershire and Sherwood Forester. Oh. Uh, I was were, a wolfer. Were they light infantry? No. No? No, 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 we were very, we were very ordinary, inf ordinary infantry. Mm. No, yeah, um, TA, Territorial Army, yes, uh, yes, for yeah, nine yeah. years. Yeah. And um, you enjoyed it? Oh, crikey. Yeah, well, see, all I wanted to be was a soldier. Mm. Uh, but, uh, you see, my passion in life is the charge of the Light Brigade. Oh, yes. And the 17th Lancers. Yes. And I was going to join the 17th, 21st Lancers. Was that straight from school? Or? No, um, it wasn't. It was, how old would I have been? Uh, 22. Um, because I had, the reason I didn't join earlier was because I had cancer. Right. And it's, it's, 50 years ago, now, this week, that I was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And you'd be a very young man. I was 18. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and I'm still here. This is quite something. But obviously I had the radiotherapy treatment, various stuff. I couldn't do anything. And then I, I filled in all my forms and everything else later, um, giving it a chance to have yeah. gone. Yeah. But the problem was, having had cancer in those mm. days, mm. Um, I got through everything apart from the medical. And then they sent me down to the Queen Alexandra's Military Hospital in London at Millbank to see two of the silliest old twats I've ever seen in my life. 90-year-old guys with white coats on who gave right. one look at me and said, you've had cancer? I said, yeah. He said, uh, go back to Derby, Mr. Felix, because you won't get in the army. Mm. I said, why is that? He said, well, if it comes back. I said, but I'm cured. Ah, oh, but it might come back, and if it does, we'll have to give you a pension. Right, that, that's incredible. So that was the end of that. Yeah, 
for a young man to actually take that in at 18, I mean... Um, yeah, it was pretty... It, it must have been quite... It, it was. Quite traumatic, Especially really. the and fact that when I went to see my doctor, I was on my own. Yeah. My dad was outside in the in the car, and when he told me, I laughed at him. Because, you know, it's the sort of thing you see on TV. You don't believe it, do you? No, it's the thing that people say, by the way, you've only got so long to live. Yes. You see it yeah. on TV, you never think it's going to happen to you. No, that's right. Uh, and I laughed at him. He says, this is not this is not laughing matter. This is, mm. this is real. I said, I know, but he said, for God's sake, don't tell my mum and dad, will you? Mm. Mm. I don't want to worry them. I could understand that. That they obviously found out, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah. you know, I'm still here to uh, to tell the tale. Yeah. Fifty years now, which is quite something. This is fantastic, really. Mm. Uh, Richard, you've done many tours of the United Kingdom with regards mm. to stories, etc. Mm. I've got to ask you, what is your favourite <laughs> story? I know you've probably got story. a lot. Story. Oh my gosh. Oh, it's, 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 there's only there is only one. Yeah. That's Harry Martindale. Uh, we're looking at York here, aren't we? And we're York. looking at the Roman Treasurer's house. Absolutely fascinating story. That's the best and you've ghost been story down in the world. I've, actually, I've, I've no, seen you in there. Yeah. I've got the last interview with Harry Martin now before yes. he died. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he took me. He met me yes. in yeah. Treasurer's house yeah. and took me down to the cellar and stood me on the spot where his twenty-something odd Roman soldiers hmm. came through the wall. Yeah. Told me the whole story. He was. 100% convinced, wasn't he? And uh, yeah. the sort of chap that wouldn't lie about no, no. anything. No. Uh, he, he had no need to do it. He was a York City policeman for 30 yes. years. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. He, was only eight, he was 18 yes. when he saw the Roman soldiers. He was a plumber's mate, wasn't he? Yes. He was working in the cellar. Yeah. He was, and he was the, a heating they came engineer. The, they actually came for the brick wall. Yeah, they came through this brick wall, the, yeah. the brick wall. Yeah, yeah. Only, only um, 18 inches below the floor, you see. Yeah. They cut them off on the knee. Yes. They were legless. Yes. yes. As yeah. Harry was later, after what yeah. you'd seen in the Sure, cellar. it would be, yeah. Um, and they went straight through through the other wall mm. uh, and vanished. Yeah. And, and basically, he, 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 I mean, he fell off his ladder. Yeah. And, and was sitting on the floor looking at them, saying, oh, my God, they're Romans. What are they going to do to me? Yeah. But they didn't do anything to him, of course, because they, they, I believe they were nothing more than a recording mm. held in the granite mm. of the Roman road, yeah. which was 18 inches below the cellar yes. floor, which yeah. cut them off at the knee and made yeah. them look yeah. legless. But the fascinating thing at the end of the interview with him, uh, I said to him, Harry, do you believe in ghosts? And he said, uh, only the ones I've seen. Mm. Yes, I can imagine it. There was some talk that Harry had somehow opened a time walk to another ear another time. Yeah. And didn't That's he possible. mention they were very thin, very emaciated? Yeah, they were. And absolutely. slightly dark skinned. Yes, and yes, absolutely. And, and everyone that looked at, at the drawing, because he did drawings of what they'd seen. Right. Nah, nah, there's no, 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 Late seventies, eighties, as you know, how people have progressed big time with with finding out more about history than they did then, mm. and they then realised that what he'd seen was Spanish auxiliaries, ninth Hispanic, the Hispanic Legion, yeah, exactly, yeah, uh, absolutely, that were stationed in York, yes, at yeah. that time when yeah. all of the Roman soldiers had been drawn back, mm. uh, AD 350, something like that, had been drawn back to Rome because mm. of the barbarians attacking Rome, and all they left here was was Cannon fodder. Yeah. Uh, Richard, when they, when they removed a lot more soil in the cellar, did they actually find the Roman fort yeah. itself? They yeah. actually found it. Yeah. And wasn't that heading towards the, the it was garrison? It goes right towards the gates of the, of the Roman fort, yes. where yeah. York Minster is now. Yeah. Um, and he, he heard a trumpet. Mm. Um, yeah. And the amazing thing is that, of course, a patrol coming back towards the, foot, the walls, the fort, would blow a trumpet to let them, them know to open the gates to let them in. I don't think they ever got in. Yeah, yeah. I think they were slaughtered outside the walls of the fort and we saw a replay yeah. uh, held in the fabric of the, uh, sorry, of, not of the, of, of the, the, what, the floor, mm. of the uh, road, yeah. the granite. Absolutely amazing. Which is one yeah. of my huge theories, you know, yeah, all about it, I, I, so actually, I agree completely, that story is fabulous, isn't I it? I think so. It really, it's an exciting story, and a, right. an interesting story, and you can always tell when someone's telling the truth, can't you? And you can always tell when someone's trying to say, pulling yeah. your leg really bad. Yeah. Harry was a very, very down to earth man. Oh, he was really. a down to earth, ordinary guy. I kept telling him, Harry, you, you need to write a book. Yeah. And he said, Well, I haven't got anything to tell. I said, But you have, you've got your life as a policeman. Because, uh, I mean, he, mm. he toured America and everything, telling his that story. That story, yes. Yeah. yeah. And to me, it's the most credible. Oh, I agree. I agree. And real, genuine, and famous ghost story. Of all time. Yeah, really yeah, is. yeah. Tremendous. Yeah. So, Richard, what's the future for Richard Felix? What's your next endeavour? <laughs> I haven't got much left. <laughs> I mean, you're a very, very vibrant character. 
I've got so many plans for the My Well, I, I start a, a new um, a six part TV series um, called Forbidden History. Right. Uh, in January. Yeah. Start filming for that. I've mm -hmm. done about series one, two, three, and four, I think, something like that, which I enjoy immensely. Right. Because uh, it's so different. Uh, my ambition is to, to. My ambition is to prove what ghosts are. Uh, and I think that TV is is still waiting, sorry, it's not waiting, the, the public is waiting mm. for a real ghost programme. Yeah. Right, but yeah. they're not getting it. No, no. They're not getting it, yeah. they're getting Scooby-Doo nonsense, people running off scared to death, demons chasing them down through, through the corridors and in the rooms, and, mm. and, and it's, everyone's now fascinated by yes. ghosts, yeah, yeah. and they want to know more. Yeah. Richard, do you find that the, the story is more interesting than the actual paranormal investigations? Yeah, I do. Yeah, and I think yeah. the reality yeah. is more interesting yes. than, than the actual Scooby-Doo side mm. of it. Mm. And I believe that people want to know what it's all about. In other words, they need a documentary yeah. Yeah. type programme yeah. that explains yeah. Yeah. what ghosts are. And I can give it them. But the problem I've got is TV don't want to know it. Because it won't be scary enough. Right. I won't right. have it's a demon chasing me. No, no. I, I suppose they're looking more at the entertainment side of yeah, the value, really, aren't they? Of course yeah. they are. Yeah. That's the problem. That's yeah. why every ghost programme now says this programme is for entertainment purposes only. Right. And right. the reason is, mm. we know that, because because they're not real. Mm. They're not, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not knocking Most Haunted in any way, um, because things happened on that programme that I can't explain. Right, right. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, it. yeah. Um, yeah. But we should have been able to go into depth and, and try and explain mm. it more than we did. Mm. But but the problem is, you see, they thought that you needed a ghost every five minutes. And it had to be scary. Right, right, right. So that everyone went upstairs to bed, scared to death to go on their own. Because that's what we love. Mm. Yeah. And there's I, room for that. Yeah, Fine. Yeah. I've often thought, Richard, it'd be really, really nice to show us, say, book a theatre and get someone like yourself and other people. Good yeah, ghost yeah, 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 yeah. And if each one is given, shall we say, three individual stories, yeah. totally different from the next person, of course, yeah, yeah. you'd have a very good entertaining night, wouldn't oh, you? you? Would. Oh, you would indeed. A really good entertaining oh, yeah. night. I tell you what, I, have, I can't believe that we haven't actually done in this country a. I would like to create something called the, the Great Paranormal Debate, where we have a panel of credible. Ghost hunters, mm -hmm. for want of a better word, let's call it ghost hunters, um, with a huge audience that we actually do question and answer type of thing to do with the paranormal and, and sort of try and get to the bottom of what it's all about. But we're not doing it, and we should do. Yeah, um, yeah. something new, isn't it? A, a new idea. A new, new idea. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. And te televise it. Yes, yeah. Um, I think it would be tremendous, and people would love it. Um, and we could find. A few credible, a few credible ghost hunters. <laughs> I'm sure. I, I do know through Most Haunted, Richard, you made uh, lots of fans in Great Britain, didn't you? And uh, oh. and and in, in many ways, it did really highlight your work, didn't it? Oh, oh yes, it did. But the problem, yeah. the reason I resigned from it was because they wouldn't allow me to do what I'm good at. And uh, why should they? It wasn't my show. It wasn't you. They wouldn't let you use your initial talent. But so. they wouldn't yeah. let me. So I mean, yeah. just quickly, if a door slammed shut, it was a scary ghost every time. Right. Well, hang on a minute. I needed to, I, after Yvette had squealed, and I'd run off because I'm frightened of ghosts, and it really would make, it would make the jump. After that had happened, and then the audience at home, who were having a most haunted party, and they got the lagers in, and the yeah. candles yeah. on, and the curtains were drawn, yeah. and everyone yeah. came, came in because they hadn't got Sky, and, mm -hmm. they, and, and they all jumped off the sofas, so they've had their entertainment. Wow! I then wanted to go away and see if someone's left a window open. Because it's a windy night. Ah, yes. Yeah. And that's why the doors An explanation. Yeah, yeah. But I wasn't I've got allowed you. to. Right, right. Because right. it was always a scary ghost that slammed it. Yeah. Though, and it was going to get us later. Yeah. Uh, Richard, out of all the locations you went to with Most Haunted, yeah. which was the one that you really enjoyed? Enjoy? Craigenos. Yeah. Craigenos, as they call it. Um, and whilst that was a belter, um, that was that was good. Um, Bottlewidden Castle. Oh, yes. When that table, Beautiful. The table shot across the floor at me. Yes. And I, again, you see, I try and um, rationalise it, and I, co I couldn't. Mm. Um, and Taunton Castle, when the first time in my life I've ever seen a table rise off the floor. Right. That was fantastic. Amazing. That was, that was, that was good. Um, lots and lots of places. Uh, Bodmin Jail. Mm. That was very good. Uh, we had a really good time at Bodmin Jail. But, I mean, you see, again, we, we did a seance in the uh, naval wing of Bodmin Jail. 
and um, we could have that that program could have been just that seance. There was no need for anything else. It was mm. so yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. But we only got a little bit of it. Ah, oh, see, it could, could have been extended. Oh, well, yeah. they, they and, and really, really else. looks in depth. Yes, it was awesome. Yeah. It was fantastic. Yeah. But nobody's seen it. Yeah, because they only saw a snippet. Yeah, yeah. Because it, it was, it didn't involve some of the people that wanted to be on it all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, Richard, I know that you do love Derby very much, mm. didn't you? Love local history, mm. which which is blatantly obvious. <laughs> but on your Facebook page, you mentioned this amazing story of a lone German bomber with a mission in daylight yeah. to actually hit Rolls-Royce in Derby. Yeah, yeah. Could you go through that story with us, please? Oh, yeah, that's an amazing story. Uh, I mean, we Derby should have been plastered because we were the head of Rolls-Royce, centre yes. of Rolls-Royce, yes. and the railways, yeah. centre of the country. Right. Um, and so the, the Germans should have absolutely hammered Derby, and they, they never did. Um, but one, one day, uh, July the 22nd, uh, 1942, one single German bomber... Um, it was 1942 and the Germans were really hard pushed on the, um, the Russian, Russian front, front. Yes. so they couldn't yes. spare mm. any plane. So one plane did a couple of practice runs, a Dornier 2017, and he came over from Holland at 150 feet, which isn't very high, and contoured, followed the contours in. He was using an AA map, a road map from before the war. Right. Um, and then he got to a place called Chelliston and he saw the railway line mm. and he followed the railway line into Rolls-Royce. He got four £1,000 bombs on board. 12 seconds before he hit the target, he hit a barrage balloon. And the whole idea of the, the it's the wire, not the balloon. That's the, the wire that would the cut wire. the wing off. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing is that they used to have an explosive charge on them, which would blow your wing off. But the WAF, Women's Royal Air Force, yes. had forgotten to set the charge on that on that particular one. Yeah. yeah. So he hit it, but he's now going down, the, the sliding down the wire, mm. but the, the front of a Dornier DO217 has a, a, a blade which cuts the wire. Right. And he cut the wire, the balloon floated away, the pilot righted the plane, but by then, 12 seconds, he was already over Rolls-Royce, and the bomb aimer pressed the button, mm. and only one bomb hit Rolls-Royce. Just one. Steel sword. One 1,000 pound yeah, bomb, yeah. and the other three hit the houses. Uh, and unfortunately one of them hit a cafe and it was mm. two minutes mm. past eight, mm. changeover time at Rolls-Royce and all the, 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 the cafe was full of workers and 22 people were killed. Gosh, that's amazing. And it's the only time Rolls-Royce was ever hit in the yeah. whole of the Second World yeah. War. Yeah. And, and we should have, we, we should have been, and here's, here's, this is one of the, one of the many things I use to try and promote the city because we don't, mm. we don't tell our stories. No, 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 no. In 1940, the Battle of Britain, 90% of the Spitfires and Hurricanes were powered with Merlin engines made in Derby. Derby. Yeah, yeah. There were no satellite factories in 1940. Mm, mm. There was 10% Merlins made at Crewe, and all of the 90% were made in Derby. If it hadn't been for Derby, yes. we'd have lost the Battle of Britain yes, and yeah. the Second World War. Yes, yeah. And as I say so often, why don't we have a Merlin Square in Derby with that on, very on the planet? So, very yeah. much so. The Dornier apparently got back home, didn't it? He got home. The pilot must have been a very good one. He was a good pilot because he was badly damaged. Yes. He was buzzed by a Spitfire on yes. the way back and he managed to get into the clouds yes. and, and escape. Yep. Went back and then uh, three members of the crew survived mm. the war. Um, and that plane um, came back again with a different crew and crashed near Bridlington. And I know, the, I know where it is. Right. Next right. year I shall be taking a spade yeah. and a metal detector. And you know, Richard, that is a fascinating it's thing amazing, to do, isn't it? Yeah. It's oh, a yeah, fascinating yeah. thing to Digging do. Digging up it? history. I think that is, uh, mm. I mean, um, up the ghost stories are brilliant, but that is also brilliant, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Well, it's a fascinating story. And subject. there is a ghost story, connect well, there's, a con there's a ghost story connected with the steel store of Rolls-Royce, where, um, because of the people that were killed in yes, it, um, yes, yeah. they're, they're still there, some of them, yeah. and, and people, various. They've just knocked it down, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but the, it was always always had ghost stories to do with the steel well, right, store right. after it was bombed. Yeah. When you look at Coventry, Coventry was practically annihilated. Yeah, Why did they choose Coventry, not Derby? Because as you mentioned... Well, why Coventry? It's, it's a, well, there was there was motive manufacturer there, I think. Um, I don't know. But you see, one of the things we did in Derby, we bent the beam, the, the radar beam, ah. and, and we, sent, we sent it to Nottingham. Ah. <coughs> yeah. Oh, right, right, right. Uh, uh, yeah, it wasn't a good yeah. thing, that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the Vale of, vale of Beaver as well. Mm. And then we also had... Um, uh, decoy villages mm -hmm. built, built with um, big 
pots of oil that right. they set fire to. Decoys. And so they dropped the bombs in other places. Yes. Yeah. Which which helped <laughs> helped Derby uh, a bit. But um, yeah, why why they bombed Coventry like this and Birmingham? Well, mm. Birmingham was an industrial mm. place, wasn't it? Mm. But Derby should have been plastered. Yes. And we yeah. weren't. We were very lucky. I know what it was really, because I mentioned tourism, you see. Yes. Me. Yeah. Basically, the problem yeah. was that uh, nobody knew where Derby was because mm. the tourism, pe tourism people didn't tell anybody. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely amazing. Well, Richard, I've got to say, it's been an absolute pleasure oh, yeah. talking to you. It's been um, really marvellous to visit you here in the jail, of course. And um, again, I've, got to, I've got to say thank you for it's all the entertainment. Thank you very much. All of us over the years. Cheers. Thank you very much indeed, Richard. Thank you.